Hello, everyone. Good to, to see you. And sorry for this uh, late connection. We had some technical troubles, but uh, everything is solved. Uh, so uh, welcome to this uh, new Tuesday lunch uh, with Rita webinar. So I'm uh, really happy to, to share this uh, to share this session with the Professor Philippa Ramos from Lisboa. Uh, so we are just back from the press meeting, and maybe some of you were also to this uh, uh, fantastic meeting from in Rotterdam. And uh, we uh, are very lucky today because we have two incredible speakers. Uh, Bruno Fautrel and, and Fabrizio De Benediti, and uh, the talks will be on the uh, Euler uh, Press recommendation. But I may let Philippa introduce the two speakers. I just need to mention that the session is recorded. You can see it um, at any time after on the Rita uh, web. Uh, um, and then the additional things is that. Uh, if you have some question, so use the chat to uh, to ask any question you are, you may have during the talk and after the talk, and the two speakers will be uh, delighted to answer all your your specific question. So I give the mic to Philippa and hope you all enjoy this uh, fantastic webinar. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining this webinar. As Alex already said, we have really two amazing invited speakers that will uh, present the very important joint initiative from EULAR and PRESS, uh, these recommendations that led to these recommendations that were agreed upon a very large task force of pediatric and adult traumatologists and also clinical immunologists and patient representatives. Uh, so we will have uh, Professor Fabrizio de Benedetti, who is a very well-known uh, pediatric rheumatology and research uh, head of the Division of Rheumatology of the Hospital Le Bambino Gesù in Rome. Uh, he was one of the conveners of these new EULAR Press recommendations, together with Professor uh, Bruno Fautrel, uh, convener as well of these recommendations. Professor Bruno Fautrel is a professor of rheumatology at uh, Sorbonne uh, University and the head of rheumatology department of the Pitié Sapitrière Hospital in Paris. And they will present us these new recommendations for the diagnosis and management of steel disease comprising systemic GIA and adult onset steel disease. So thank you, Philippa. We organize the talk. I will start, then Fabrizio will continue uh, and would we'll mix at some point during the, the presentation. So yes, it, it was really a pleasure to do this um, this job together with Eula and Press and all the members of the task forces uh, to achieve to something which seems to us very important to improve the care of the patients with steel disease. So these were the people who were involved in this recommendation process. Uh, we were accompanied, of course, with the methodologist. It was Loreto uh, Carmona from, uh, from Spain. And we, have, we had three fellows, uh, Stefan Mitrovic, Ariana De Mateis, and Sarah Bindoli. And this is the team, so many people. And we achieved to do that uh, within two meetings. The first one in Paris in September 2022, where we set up the scene, we defined the question that we wanted to address. And the second one was in Rome uh, in March 2024. And, here, uh, and during this meeting, we really um, uh, defined and wrote uh, the, the recommendation or the overarching principles that seem to us very important to 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 to, to provide. And uh, just to, to recall that the, the, the aim of this uh, of this recommendation are to provide a, a, a very useful tool to help rheumatologists, adult or pediatric rheumatologists, but also to help patients or caregiver uh, to understand what is rational to, to organize the care of the patient, to use specific treatment rather than other. So it's really something to, to have a consensus between adult and uh, pediatric rheumatologists from different parts of Europe, but also from people from the, some colleagues from the United States uh, in order to have something really very robust to be used in daily practice. So we uh, addressed four main issues. The first one was to say, is it really one single issue and can we use one single name instead of uh, uh, systemic GIA and adult onset C disease? The second question was about the diagnosis and especially how to make rapidly the diagnosis, so the notion of early diagnosis. 
The third point was about the treatment target and the treatment strategy to be implemented to, to manage the patient. And the fourth one was about the complication, the, the screening for complication and how to manage this complication of the disease. And for that, we did four literature searches, uh, one about the prevalence of, of clinical manifestation and complication in the two still diseases. The second one was about the performance of diagnostic biomarkers. The third one was about treatment. And we had a, a, a fourth literature search for the macrophage activation syndrome covering diagnostics, biomarker, and treatment. And so the search has been done on Medline, Embase, and Cochrane, uh, and from the 20th century up to February uh, 2023. And everything has been recorded in the Prospero database. So just to uh, recall that we had before to start this uh, this uh, recommendation process, we had two diseases: one for um, for children, one for adults. The first one was described at the end of the 19th century, and the second one, the adult one, was in the middle or second part of the 20th century. In both cases, there was the fever, rash, and some joint symptoms. Arthritis for children, but for adults, it was arthralgia or arthritis. And we don't have really robust uh, prevalence data or epidemiological data, but you see that based on several studies, uh, we have a prevalence in children slightly higher than in, in adults. And of course, I won't recall you the different symptoms, but you know that very well. Up to now, we were. It was five years ago when we did this uh, this graph. We identified that uh, inflammasome activation was something very important, and LP3 seemed to be the one who was uh, really involved. And there was a, a, a key role for IL-1 beta and also IL-18. And based on that, the the, the involvement of innate cells, innate immunity uh, cells, seems to be really the major phenomenon, immunologic phenomenon in this disease, and especially with the role for macrophage monocytes, but also for, for, for neutrophils. And little by little, we know that all other cells are involved, like NK cells or, or T cells, so uh, component of the adaptive immunity. And all these things, we don't know exactly how, will result in the cytokine storm or the cytokine burst that is observed. And at that time, we also made the hypothesis that potentially there could be a role for uh, dysfunction in the resolution of inflammation that explains that the inflammation will last for weeks uh, without any treatment. Uh, more recently, there was some additional information about the role of interferon, especially interferon gamma, specifically in macrophage activation syndrome. And in this paper of Claudia Bacaglia uh, from uh, Fabrizio's team, you see that the level of interferon gamma is much higher when you have a mass associated to still disease uh, compared to, to patients with only active system in GIA. And these chemokines, say XL9, 10, and 11, which are induced by interferon gamma production, are also very increased, but only in patients with macrophage activation syndrome. So it gives a, 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 a picture in which you have here, a, let's say, standard active HGIA, and maybe we can say the same for adult onset C disease. And depending on the condition, maybe the background of the, of the patient, there, there is a, an evolution of, of the, the, the immune system towards something which is more global, and Fabrizio will come back to that later, with the role not only of IL-1 and IL-18, but also interferon gamma. So when we start the, 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 the process of recommendation, the first overarching principle that seemed to be very important to, 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 to make is that FGA and AOSD are the same disease, and it should be designated by the same and unique name, still disease. And we just kept between parentheses the notion of LGA and AOSD because the label for, for the medication are, have used this term. So we wanted just to maintain this link. But now we would be very happy if the term C disease remained the only one. Why would we conclude that? 
because when we did the, the literature review with all the clinical manifestations related to FGIA and AOSD, you have here a, a prevalence beta analysis, and you see that in dark, uh, in black, it's the children, in gray, it's the adults, and you see the frequency of the different symptoms are really very similar between children and adults. When you see differences, for example, for myalgia or sore throat, it's more related to, on, on the fact that pediatricians are not, let's say, doesn't pay too much attention to these uh, symptoms. Sore throat is really very frequent. Myalgia is something which is a little bit vague for young children to be mentioned. And for, you have the same for weight loss, which could be something uh, uh, very relevant in adults, but less uh, specific in children. You have uh, the same feeling for uh, uh, lab uh, investigations, where you have exactly the same and the same thing with, with a very close uh, or, or overlapping prevalence. And when you see a difference, it's just because the, the, the threshold to, to speak about anemia or increase in uh, white blood cell count is really related to uh, the norms are different between children and adults, then it's not really differential between the two uh, components of cell disease. Uh, an important thing is that although we say it's one single disease, uh, the age can be important and not all the same, uh, all the, the ages or, or people of, the, of different ages express uh, the disease uh, similarly. There is a peak of the disease before the age of six. And in this uh, work by, by the Fabrizio Sim, you see that macrophage activation syndrome is much more frequent in young children compared to adults. So there are differences between children and adults, although the, 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 the nature and the pathogenesis of the disease is the same. The second operating principle is to remember that we have to define the treatment target and the therapeutic strategy based on the shared decision making between the patient or the parents and the physician. Very important to involve the patient and the family in this process. That we need to apply the treat to target uh, paradigm that have been proposed and used uh, in other uh, inflammatory joint diseases. And the ultimate goal which is very important and different from other diseases, the ultimate goal is to achieve drug-free remission. In the majority of, the, of these patients, it will be possible to stop the treatment at some point in the, the, the course of the disease. And finally, we wanted to highlight that macrophage activation syndrome um, should be a, a, a concern throughout disease evolution. Uh, and so it should be detected promptly and treated rapidly. So it's something which is very important uh, to, to keep that in mind, uh, whatever the, the initial presentation of the disease. In terms of diagnosis, uh, we highlighted the, that to facilitate the diagnosis, we could use some operational definition, especially fever, which is really very uh, key in, in the diagnosis. It should be uh, spiking with temp high temperature above 39 degrees Celsius for at least seven days, meaning that it's more than a few days, it's weeks and not days. The second is about the rash. So this is a, the, um, the rash is transient, con concomitant of fever spikes. Uh, it's usually defined as salmon peak, but sometimes you may have some different expression of the rash, especially with the TKI. Musculoskeletal involvement is usually present with arthritis or myalgia, and here you don't see arthritis because what we want to say is that overt arthritis is supported but not necessary for a diagnosis and may appear later, and it's very important for children. And finally, we highlighted the high level of inflammation with neutrophilic leukocytosis, high serum therapy, and high uh, serum therapy. So here, just one word about arthritis. Arthritis it does not happen very early in the course of the disease. Here in this uh, work, it was with a median of one month after the start of the disease. And this is why if you wait for arthritis, you will lose time. And it's something which seems to be, to be deleterious for the patient. We know that there are several set of classifications that criteria that have been, that have been produced. Uh, 
three for children, Ayla, Kara, and Pinto, two for adults, Yamaguchi and Fortress Criteria. Uh, they are partially overlapping, not fully. Uh, and we highlighted that here the Yamaguchi criteria, they have been tested in adults, but also in children. They have, they have been validated in, in different populations, different cohorts of patients. And actually, you see that the sensitivity and the specificity are really very interesting and, and uh, usable in clinical practice. And when you combine Yamaguchi criteria with variety, you see you increase again the sensitivity and the specificity. However, we don't have, uh, especially we, we don't have, we, we didn't have a, a, in the group enough US colleagues to say we will recommend to use only one classification criteria. So it has been written to the research agenda that in the coming year, it will be very useful to have one single classification criteria for children and adults. And in terms of diagnosis, the other important information is about the, the, the role of IL-18 and has protein. So IL-18 is a key cytokine, which is really highly elevated in cell disease. And maybe something relevant to, to reinforce the diagnosis. However, uh, we don't have a unique threshold for this cytokine, and it appears difficult to, to use it in clinical practice. Also, in many expert centers, we use, we do these tests on a routine basis, but it's not robust enough to, to introduce that in a, or to force people to use IA18 in, in a recommendation such as this one. And we have approximately the same with S100 proteins. The alarmins are, um, are involved to amplify the inflammation. And calprotectin has been proposed, but also the S so calprotectin is S100 A8, A9 protein, but we know there is also the S100 A12 protein. And we need additional um, data to see in what extent it can be useful to help uh, or to ascertain the diagnosis of cell disease. And finally, we know that alter alternative diagnoses have to be ruled out, especially malignancies, infectious disease, other inflammatory disorder. And in the recommendation, the final document, there will be a list of investigation and a list of, of potential diagnoses that have been, that, that needs to be uh, uh, searched for, addressed, and eventually uh, ruled out. Very important, the management of the patient to define some targets. So we need to measure disease activity. And here we know that for children, the STIADAS had been developed specifically for systemic um, uh, GIA. So you see here the STIADAS. Actually, it's not completely uh, destabilizing for an adult physician because it's very close to the DAS, for example. But you have this systemic score which may help to introduce this uh, quantification of, of inflammation related to systemic manifestation. In adults, we are more used to use a modified push or score, and it's a list of items, one point by item, and we have, based on the experience, some threshold which are not completely validated. But yet, it's not enough to recommend to use one or the other in both populations. So what we said, is that uh, we need to write on the research agenda that we need to define a unique and single disease activity measure for both children and adults. But for the recommendation purpose, we want to, uh, we, we decided to use the term clinically inactive disease, which is something very well known by pediatrician, uh, so, uh, which is defined as the absence of cell disease related symptoms with normal ESR or normal, normal CRP. And remission is then a period of time of at least six months with clinically, clinically inactive disease. The second thing is that the target is important, but the timing of the target is really very important. Uh, at the very beginning, the, the, um, some life-threatening uh, complication may happen. So we have to, to be very uh, strict in the follow-up of the patient with a close monitoring. So we identified intermediate targets at day seven, resolution on fever and reduction of CRP by half. At week four, no fever, reduction of active uh, joint uh, by more than 50%, a normal CRP, 
and a physician or a patient global assessment less than 20 on a 0 to 100 VAs. At month three, we want a clinical inactive disease with low dose glucocorticoids because low dose of glucocorticoids are an issue uh, due to side effects. And so we want at three months to have a low dose of glucocorticoids, less than 0.1 milligram per kilogram per day for adults and 0.2 milligram per kilogram per day uh, for uh, children. And at month six, we want clinically inactive disease without glucocorticoids. And then I let the floor to uh, Fabrizio to continue on treatment. Thank you, Bruno. We will go back and forth a little bit. Uh, next slide, please, Bruno. So um, uh, these are the statements. Um, uh, and, you can see, and you can see we wanted to make three points here. One, uh, no steroids are symptomatic treat treatments and can be used as bridging therapy. Glucocorticoids are very efficacious, and we know this very well. However, uh, long-term use must be avoided uh, in order to achieve and maintain the target. So you should never think that you can maintain and achieve your targets by using high glucocorticoids. And on the other hand, the evidence for the efficacy of L1 and L6 inhibition of still disease is supported by a high level of evidence, and therefore the use should be prioritized. Next slide, please, Bruno. I'm not seeing the slide moving. Yes, they are. So we did a, a systematic review. Thank you, Bruno. A systematic review, and you see a number of studies that were included. We'll skip the slide. It's a huge number of um, longitudinal observation and uh, retrospective and prospective studies, and unfortunately, only some clinical trials. This clinical trial, next slide, Bruno, will use, was used to evaluate um, to perform a, a, some uh, simple meta-analysis. Uh, here is uh, uh, an RCR50 response meta-analysis in the trials performed with L1 inhibitors. And as you can see, the um, uh, prediction of efficacy is, is very high and significant. Next slide, please. And the same is true for IL-6 inhibitors. Uh, you should know a few things. One, Withdrawal design trials were not included in this meta-analysis because it's impossible to evaluate properly the effect of placebo. Uh, and in some cases, it was very difficult to um, properly define efficacy outcome at given time points. So the number of clinical trials that are shown here may look pretty low. Next slide, please. What I think... There's a delay. Yeah, what we have done actually using the uh, lo longitudinal retrospective and prospective study was try to look at the real life uh, efficacy of IL-1, IL-6 and TNF inhibitors. And what you see, you see here is a pool analysis for the IL-1 inhibitors. And the pool analysis will say that you can achieve ACR70 or clinical inactive disease in 60% of the patient. Next slide, please. A very similar number you can get it if you look uh, if you look for IL-6 uh, inhibitor study. That's only one. That oscilizumab obviously again showing 55% um, of uh, positive responses. But if you do so, uh, uh, next slide please for TNF inhibitors, then you see that the response is uh, lower. It's only 26%. This was the this analysis, although not being a formal meta-analysis, was deemed necessary because of the fact that a large body of data are available outside clinical trials, and there are no clinical trials for TNF inhibitors in SGIA. Next slide, please. Um, so we next we next wanted to really. Um, you know, defined that the initiation of IL-1 and IL-6 should be as early as possible. This was linked to what Bruno told you about the need for an early and rapid diagnosis. You need not to waste time. Next slide, please. And this is really linked to the concept that all of you know of the window of opportunity that may exist in, in SGIA. Uh, this is modified from the 
very famous review from Peter Nigrovich. You have seen these slides, I think, thousands of times. I'm not going into that. But the idea that the early phase of the disease is particularly responsive to L1 and IL-6 inhibitor, uh, Peter made the hypothesis for IL-1, obviously, is, is very compelling. Next slide, please. And again, there are no clinical trial, trials that formally demonstrated that early treatment is better than late treatment. However, going back again to uh, longitudinal observation and retrospective on prospective study, these are the few studies that compared early versus late treatment. And if you looked at the number, usually is clinical inactive disease in this study, you see that early versus late, there is a inevitable difference in this study. If you uh, include, next slide please, in, 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 in a table that is almost going to be not readable, the evidence uh, or the percent response in the early treatment, uh, prospective or retrospective cohort, compared to the clinical trials, that's a late treatment on the bottom, you see that essentially you end up with the number shown in bold on your right. Early treatment for 50 to 100% clinical inactive disease, a late treatment either in the real world or in clinical trial around 30%. So that's very suggestive of, an, of an evidence, for, or evidence for a better efficacy in the short term for the early treatment. Next slide. But it, please, uh, Bruno, but if we are going to accept the hypothesis that was made by Peter Nigrovich, the real issue is not only getting a short-term response, but also, and particularly, um, avoiding the persistent course. This is the mean percentage of patients with persistent course in the pre-biological era, uh, pulling together all the studies that provided data on persistent disease. Next slide, please. And if you compare to some initial data that are being developed um, by some of us, um, then you see that there is a, an evident difference. These are data from the Dutch prospective cohort, early treatment with anakinra, withdrawal on anakinra if they achieve clinical remission, clinical remission for at least six months. And these are three years follow-up data showing that a little bit more than 25% of patients have persistent disease. And all those are data on an even smaller number of patients from our cohort. We now have 42 uh, patients, so we'll have new data pretty soon. Um, that's approximately 10% of patients have persistent disease. So this is compelling evidence suggesting that early treatment may actually prevent the occurrence of persistent cause. Next slide, please. So I will well, now with you, Paul. Yeah. Uh, so once you have achieved the uh, target, you have to wait a little bit uh, to to start tapering the treatment. So what we co recommended was to say that the maintenance of CID for three to six months without glucocorticoid should be achieved before initiating uh, biology DMART uh, tapering. And actually, what we recommended is, as usual for this treatment, is to space out the injections and to increase the delay between two injections to see uh, if the clinical inactive disease can be maintained with lower um, dose uh, of, of biology DMART. So this, and with this proposal of, of uh, algorithm to, to manage this patient. Once you made the diagnosis, you check if you have high disease of activity. If you have this high level of, of disease activity, then you need to use high dose glucocorticoids, probably IV first, then oral, in association with IL-1 or IL-6 inhibitors, meaning that you combine since the beginning the two in order to achieve a rapid response and to block the development of, of the disease. If the disease activity is not so high, we highlighted that we really want to use IL-1 and IL-6 inhibitors, and then glucocorticoids can or cannot be used depending on the situation. And if you use glucocorticoids, you can use low or intermediate dose of glucocorticoids. Then you're likely to achieve a clinical inactive disease with low dose, low, uh, low dose of glucocorticoids at month three. Then you will start a progressive uh, tapering uh, of the glucocorticoid and you 
you continue to taper up to uh, the full discontinuation of the glucocorticoid and you maintain the biologic uh, ongoing. And if you achieve what we want, clinically reactive disease of glucocorticoid at month six, then we'll speak about biologic DMARC tapering, it's part two. If you're not able to achieve um, the CID uh, with low-dose corticoid, then you have to discuss about the rotation of IL-1 or IL-6 uh, inhibitor, uh, and you continue to, uh, to, to try to taper the steroid. Here, in case of inadequate response to one or the other agent, or in case of impossibility to completely stop uh, prednisone, then you are first to contact uh, one of the reference center. You have also to rule out infections that may interfere with disease activity, with the evaluation of the disease, and with the, the, the treatment. And eventually, you can discuss some uh, other treatment like uh, cyclosporine or eventually experimental uh, therapy, since some trials are ongoing and may help in this kind of situation. This is the ideal trajectory. You start, you achieve rapidly at point three the CID with low dose corticoid, then you taper and you discontinue completely the glucocorticoid, you continue uh, to maintain the clinical inactive disease, but without any glucocorticoid. In the part two, once you have achieved CID without glucocorticoid at month six, you start tapering, um, you, you continue the treatment for three to six months. And if remission is maintained, because CID becomes now remission, then you start the tapering of IL-1 or IL-6 inhibitors. If there is a problem, if there is a flare, then you go back uh, at the, in part one, or eventually, if the situation is problematic, you contact the, your, your, your closest uh, ERN center uh, to discuss the, the, the case and to see what can be done for this patient. Hopefully, you will be able to achieve a drug-free remission. Then it will, it will be more uh, to educate the patient and to, a relapse is possible, and then to educate the patient what to do in case of uh, recurrence of the symptoms. And again, this is the ideal trajectory that we want to achieve with this patient. Back to you, Fabrizio. Yeah. So, uh, having discussed the approach to a standard patient, we have seen there are some uh, yellow boxes in there, and these are the real challenging patient, the one that may develop complications. And during this process, we concentrated our attention to MAS and to this new emerging lung disease. Next slide, please. Let's talk about MAS first. So, it's life-threatening, and it may, uh, and both uh, MAS and lung disease may develop that at any time point during the disease course. So we should be actively screening and monitoring the patient. Next slide, please. Um, the, the, uh, there are a number of criteria that we are using to uh, you know, help us in, in classify or diagnose MAS, and they are all of help, but they contain all of them, a pattern of clinical and laboratory findings that are important in, uh, in, uh, in, the di in diagnosing MAS. Next slide, please. And in this context, uh, I'd like to kick in with uh, um, uh, the, de the definition of hyperinflammation and MAS. And you, you, it will be clear for you why uh, we decided to do so. So autoimmunity, we are all familiar with. It's an adaptive immunity issue. Next slide is autoinflammation, we are all familiar with. This is an innate immunity issue, okay, in which we have uh, abnormal response uh, leading to tissue damage. Hyperinflammation is, on the one hand, next slide, please. It's, on the one hand, in between, because it's too much of a response uh, it's an excessive response um, uh, to a reasonable stimulus to do so, viral infection, leading to activation of both innate and adaptive immunity and leading to uh, damage to the host. Most hyperinflammatory syndrome are actually lethal, if not treated. Next slide, please. And more, more very recently, actually a few months ago, just 
but there, there has been an effort uh, in which Scott Kanna and myself convened a large group of experts from very different fields, from ICU, rheumatology, infectious disease people, um, neonatology, ER, uh, that wanted really to make a few points uh, at the early stage of diagnosis and management of uh, what we called HLH MAS. The next slide, please. And, and the name is, is an issue, and we occasionally use... I just wanted to show you a picture of the people sitting there. Sorry, this was the first meeting in 2019, right before COVID, and then uh, things got a little more complicated for one and a half year, and then we finished. Next slide, please. And what I want to make clear is that MAS is part of the so-called hyperinflammatory syndrome, cytokine storm syndrome. And if you looked at the recognizable pattern, which is listed here, this is typically MAS, it's typically HLH. So there are a number of clinical and laboratory findings that are individually non-specific, but they must, when evaluated collectively and longitudinally over time, they may really help you to identify hyperinflammation and the potential danger. And I would say that among these, centrally ferritin and repeated measurement of ferritin are, are important. The next, next slide, please. And you see MAS is here somewhere uh, in, in the long list of diseases that really are characterized by hyperinflammation. Next slide, please. If you look at the criteria, that I briefly mentioned before in this statement. Here they are. You don't need to, to go into the details, but you see the same feature and the same elements of the pattern of the clinical and laboratory pattern that we just discussed previously. So you can use this criteria, yes, but particularly make sure that you look for trends, uh, uh, for trends over time of this parameter. Next slide, please. So, um, obviously, the mainstay of treatment is glucocorticoids, and there is no way to reason around this. Uh, and, and that should be high dose glucocorticoids, usually high V, very often pulses. Uh, treatment from which there is evidence in the literature uh, there is only one clinical trial, that's the one with the uh, interferon gamma inhibitor, uh, emapalumab. But there is evidence in the literature are anakinra often high dose, cyclosporin, and as I mentioned, emapalumab. They could be considered in severe patients as part of the initial therapy. Next slide, please. So uh, we won't go through that, but if you want to go back, this is a table which will be included in the manuscript showing dosing regimen for children and adults of these drugs. There are other drugs which are more experimental, like JAK inhibitors. We usually, usually, not us, not the two of us, but people usually tend to look to use RUXO more than others. Um, etoposides or low dose regimen etoposide has also been proposed. Next slide, please and could be of use, particularly in less well-resourced countries. Now, the other issues that we are encountering in children, but it, that is becoming um, uh, recognized also in adults, is this lung disease, uh, which uh, may present uh, um, uh, in, in a subtle way uh, during the course of the disease, usually not at onset, very often in patients with MAS, as we will see, and here are the two statements. We should screen for symptoms, some of them are listed here, um, and, and actually do not, do not wait too long to perform a high resolution CT scan in any patient with a clinical suspicions. Next slide, please. What, what, what are we talking about? And this is particularly for our adult colleagues that have not seen this. Actually, this was first observed in the US. Uh, five years ago, and it's becoming more and more evident also in Europe. We now have 50 cases in Europe described. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the, the clubbing and the subtle resistant cough and tachypnea are the presenting sign. The clubbing is typically erythematous, uh, which is unusual. Uh, CT scan shows the feature described here. The histopathology shows something like PAP, pulmonary alveolar proteinosis. However, with an inflammatory infiltrate uh, that includes a lot of uh, uh, T cells. Um, next slide, please. 
there are a number of risk factors, if I may say so, that are known to be associated uh, to the onset. This is numbers from the European series, but actually uh, the numbers from the American series has been published like a couple of weeks ago. They are pretty similar. Uh, lower age, chronic persistent disease, clubbing, eosinophilia is very frequent. IL-18 levels are most often elevated. Uh, uh, most of the patient had been exposed to L1 or IL-6 inhibitors, but any patient with the CIA would have been exposed to L1 or IL-6 inhibitors. Next slide, please. There is a, 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 a still an issue, and those are all part of the research agenda. Uh, uh, in a couple of papers uh, and in a number of ongoing studies, uh, there has been a demonstration of an association of lung disease with the carriage of the RDRB-115, and you see here the number uh, what is the role for SGI, for DRB-115 in the development of SGIA lung disease? We still don't know. So this is really something that is of particular importance in the research agenda. Next slide, please. And we are almost there. Now, what are the hypotheses for this um, uh, new presentation in SGIA and uh, in stills? Uh, there's one hypothesis that uh, uh, is linked to a, 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 a drug, L1 and L6 blocker as antigen. And there is a second one that is actually based on the derangement of T cell differentiation pathway uh, by uh, early use of IL-1 and IL-6. So we think the disease is changing in phenotype. Both of these hypotheses have a number of pros and cons. The DRESS hypothesis um, has very little pro, I have to say, so I'm more and more prone towards the cytokine plasticity hypothesis, uh, which actually would um, um, hypothesize that you are, you are skewing uh, towards TH1 and interferon gamma by blocking IL-1 and IL-6. The advantage is that the second hypothesis uh, as an implication, the modification of treatment, thank you, Bruno. And the second one, actually, you should avoid using the IL-1 and IL-6 inhibitor, and that's of major danger. Next slide, please. As you may manage. As, and therefore, there is a statement that was agreed by, this, by the great majority of the expert uh, regarding the uh, Insufficient present insufficient evidence to withdraw first line L1 or L6 inhibitors in patients with lung disease risk factors at onset, and there is insufficient evidence to withdraw L1 or L6 inhibitors in patients developing still lung disease. However, uh, we also believe that, uh, um, uh, and we strongly agree that we should modify treatment and T cell directed therapy may be considered. And you have seen the mTOR directed animal models. And in which you appear to, uh, in which mTOR appear to play a relevant role in, in T cell plasticity. Next slide, please. And I think we are almost there. Bear with us. So, Bruno, back to you. Uh, just this was uh, something which was present in many of our discussion uh, during the second meeting to say that for patients who are difficult to treat does not respond appropriately, uh, uh, adequately to, to I1 or I6 blocker. For those patients with severe mass or with lung disease, they have to be managed in collaboration with steel disease expert centers. And this is one of the reasons to be of the RITA ERN. So it's very important for everybody to know that there are reference centers in many countries, if not in all countries. And in front of this patient, there is no problem to contact these centers and these experts to discuss what could be the best investigation or the best option, uh, therapeutic option, to manage this patient. And with this last recommendation, we will thank you uh, for your attendance. We will be happy to answer to your question. And this is where everything started. It was uh, at the end of the SER meeting in Atlanta in November 2019, in the launch. Delta Air France launch, and we met with Fabrizio uh, around the buffet, and we had in mind, well, I think it's time to move on and to work on this recommendation, and we had just wait a few months for COVID, 
But once COVID was over, we restarted the process and this is where we are now. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bruno Fabrizio. Fantastic presentation and uh, there are a lot of things that can be solved uh, at the buffet. So that's uh, the first key message maybe we can uh, consider. So I don't know if there are some questions uh, uh, in the audience. I'm looking at the, the chat or the Q&A, but maybe uh, Philippa and I, we could start um, with some. So you mentioned that the expertise within RITA exists, and I can also uh, mention the CPMS system that can uh, help people within the RITA network. So it's a way to present your clinical case uh, in front of experts. And there is a, a usually three or four experts that can uh, uh, challenge the, 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 the clinical case and collectively uh, decide uh, uh, the, the management. So it's a real offer of RITA to any colleagues uh, uh, in, within the RITA network. Um, I was wondering, is there some um, specific um, cell-based therapy that can that are in the future that can be offered in in this uh, still disease it was not mentioned essentially maps but what's the the future it was not the, the the topics of today but i i benefit of your expertise to think about new possibility to treat the patients Fabrizio. so I guess there is an old cell therapy that we have been using, that are, is being used in SGIA, which is uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. The problem is that the, the and, and this has been, will be reviewed, uh, well, nine cases will be presented in the proceeding of the um, meeting of the Systemic GIA Foundation, which is a foundation that really helped a lot in moving the field, patient-driven um, foundation. and. Uh, um, so the take-home message here it's old but it's new at the same time Alexander because we use different conditioning regimen and we're now all re using reduced conditioning regimen the last three transplant I'm aware of we have performed on a background of hemapalobam and anakinra which helps in maintaining the inflammation down therefore preventing graft rejection graft rejection does really look like MAS so it's really great to prevent this. And, you know, we have transplanted one, and I know of at least two patients. One is actually published uh, on, in which the transplantation was done on hemapalumab, and they really had a very uneventful uh, course. So I think that should be considered in severe patients with advanced lung disease. We should never get there. We should be able not to get there. We should be able to treat patients early. We should be able... To, uh, and we will be able to target AL-18 in the near future. There will be a trial with the bispecific antibody, which was not mentioned today, for bispecific antibody targeting AL-1 and AL-18. Uh, there is an AL-18 antibody coming out. Um, so there is a mapalumab over there. So I think, I think we might not get there. We might just treat the, the pathogenic mechanism. Well, agreeing, and I think this recommendation with this early detection, early management, using half maps early will definitely change the the path of this patient. So I, I see there are some questions in the yeah, chat. So, yeah. Philippa, have you seen that? Yes, yes, we have uh, some questions now. The first one that uh, I think it is this one. Hello, thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. A little provocative question, maybe. How do you explain the cytokine plasticity theory with the cohort of only one out of 65 patients with lung disease, systemic GIA, considering that they have early treatment with Bionic Maybe to Fabrizio. This, this, is, this must be somebody who has looked at the Dutch data. I agree with you. I don't think we can explain. I think, I think not all of us are the same and not all of us respond the same way. Uh, my, my personal opinion is that we have been using too little if any glucocorticoids in this patient at the very beginning of the disease because we were, we were so happy about the L1 and R6, particularly L1 inhibitors all in the disease, that we actually allow some skewing to occur. Then you need the proper genetic background. What the heck is DRB115 doing? We have no clue. 
so I think we need to understand. I think, but we need to be vigilant. We need to be vigilant, and the evidence is mounting for the need or the potential utility of a T cell directed therapy. Now, the mTOR story is great. Um, should we all switch to rapamycin? I don't know yet, okay? But we have been using MMF for two years now. Um, and uh, and uh, we are thinking about switching to rapamycin. Um, cyclosporin, we have, been, we have been in love with cyclosporin for decades. Now we don't use it because we have, you know, decent treatment for MAS, decent treatment for chronic uh, MAS patients, and therefore we're just not using it. Maybe it's, they should be combined. This is, a, I believe, one of the most important items for the research agenda in the next couple of years. Bruno, would, would you like to add anything? I think, no, yeah. maybe Bruno, or, well, we have a couple of additional questions and not that many, much time. So, yes, Bruno. Importantly, uh, there is a genetic background, there is the HLA uh, need, for example, but there is some potential environmental factor who can be the target to start. So, we, we don't, well, we did not understand everything, let's say. So, and up to now it has been discovered or described in children, but now we are looking to our, with our, to our old files or medical charts, and we also observe this kind of patient in, uh, in adults. So, I think it's... Uh, it's an ongoing story. So we have a question by Juan. Thanks for the great lecture, Juan, from San Juan de Deud in Barcelona. Fabrizio, any thinking about IgE as a biomarker in a systemic GIA, or we should say still disease? I follow some refractory systemic patients, mainly with skin recurrence, with high eosinophils and IgE, and variable extra skin features, um, almost all persistent skin disease, even needing to use anti-IgE antibodies. So what's your feeling? I have no clue. That's a very good question. We know that there are patients with elevated IgE, and I'm sure, Bruno, you see them in adults as well. You do, eh? Yeah, yeah. or chronic urticaria. Uh, um... Yeah. So, I, I really, I, I cannot answer the question. I've never seen such a high IgE patient and such a difficult urticaria to treat that I would uh, that I needed anti-IgE antibody, but I will be pleased to discuss offline um, if you want, and let's see what what we can do. Certainly, eosinophilia is present in a in, in a significant portion of patients. I, I don't know really. Um, question when, by when Carla. The will be published. I, yes. I, I see the question. So it's easy. The, the manuscripts are almost uh, done and we have to have the, the review by the EULA and the press. So probably it will be early 2024. Good news. It's a very important um, paper. So we have a question by Carla. Could you spend a few words on the role of those adjustments for patients with incomplete response to uh, IL-1 or 6 inhibition? So maybe I, I can start. So, uh, the dose adjustment, we are not very clear on what can be done. In adults, for example, in some patients who are using anakinra at 200 uh, milligrams per day, so it's two injections per day, uh, it's not very frequent, and probably these patients are the one with very active disease, and probably we have more to consider or to look for HLA diabetes 115, for example, and to search for hyperinflammatory manifestation, and then maybe move for um, uh, uh, T-cell immunosuppressant, for example. Um, besides that, we have injection site reaction, we have inadequate response to I1. So what we are doing uh, on a daily practice is we start with an akinra. If it does not work frequently, we switch for I6 inhibitors. And I know in pediatrician probably you do differently, but for adult rheumatologists, canakinumab is the last option due to a price issue. And for a long period of time, we did not any uh, official reimbursement for, for canakinumab in adults. Fabrizio. So, so the, the dosing regimens are really an issue, and I, and I understand the question, and I see also Bruno's point. Uh, you certainly can increase the dose. In, in cryopyrinopathies, you can go up in children 
I mean, people go up up to 12 milligram per kilogram every four weeks uh, with no safety issue and certainly obtaining better control of the disease uh, compared to the standard two or four milligram per kilogram every four weeks. Same is true for tocilizumab. So PK data would suggest that if you have not been able to neutralize your CRP down to zero, zero, you you have not neutralized IL-6. And therefore, in the presence of inadequate response to one of the two, I would consider it certainly seriously the option of increasing the dose before just discarding that mechanism of action as, as not efficient in that patient. So particularly in children where uh, a faster clearance is present, present, I think one should take this into account. That was not discussed in the recommendation because it's it's not even expert opinion, it's feelings, not even opinion. Thank you, Fabrizio. We have one last question from Adrian. Regarding the work made by Puli and his team, what do you think as a possible use of mTOR inhibitors in severe GIA patients with or without cytokine blockade treatment? Thank you very much once again for this wonderful talk. I think we already responded to the reply to this question. I think we are using T cell um, inhibitor in patient T cell directed therapy in patients with, uh, you know, either initial lung disease, but we screen very often. Um, and aggressively, or with uh, uh, signs or factors that represent risk factor for lung disease. We are, since we saw the paper, uh, we are considering switching to rapamycin, and well, actually a couple of patients have already been switched to rapamycin. So I think mTOR is something we should consider. I know that in Boston, they only use mTOR inhibitor. Mm. That's interesting. Mm. So I think we now come to the end of the talk. So um, slightly with three minutes delay, but we started uh, a bit late. So I would really like to to thank you both for this uh, fantastic talk. And this is really something that will change the management of patients. So thank you for driving this huge work and to sharing this with us uh, today. Um, I, uh, I could mention, so to all uh, attendees, uh, there were up to 75, which is very good, uh, that uh, it is recorded and it can be shared to the to the world community and uh, see you next month the um, title are not totally finished for the for the world program but we should meet again the first tuesday of each month so next month will be the, the on auto inflammatory disease and uh, have a have a nice day thank you to philippa and everyone here bye bye thank you bye thank bye. you thank you